Hello, everybody. Welcome. I was going to say happy Wednesday, but it is not Wednesday. It, it is, is not Thursday. Wednesday. <laughs> happy Thursday. Yes, happy Thursday. Thursday. Awesome. See some familiar faces. I see some new faces in here. Hello, everybody. Lots of skills members. Lots of yes. skills members. It's Wendy. Hi, Wendy. If you guys have the ability to turn on your camera, we'd love to see your faces. If you know you're in the bathroom or you're getting changed or it's just not appropriate to turn on your camera, <laughs> please don't. But uh, we like seeing faces. We like engaging. I so, have a rule: and- cameras only in my course. You gotta, I gotta see your face. Uh-oh, I like that. Okay. I like that. Very cool. Well, we're gonna we're gonna give it about two minutes, and then we're gonna jump right in because. I sent the, uh, the kind of the breakdown of the agenda to, to Kelly and, and Melody. And afterwards, I was like, that's a lot of content for an hour. <laughs> no way we're getting through it all. <laughs> I, I know, but I'm really excited for this conversation that, that we're going to have. We've kind of all been, the three of us have talked about doing something like this. And, uh, you know, if you guys enjoy it, maybe it's something that, you know, we can, we can do again. Um, so awesome. So Melody, what were you doing right before this? I think you were just in a Zoom, right? Yes, we had our certified pediatric ninja specialist course today. Yesterday, we had our instructor certification mastermind. Uh, but two days of breaking down child development strategies and mindset, theory X versus theory Y, and how we're going to change the world through understanding science and psychology of the way that children learn and grow. That sounded so scripted, but it just came out. (laughs) Super nerdy too, but I like it. Yeah, I had to get the glasses, you know. (laughs) It does help, right? Kelly, what were you doing before this? Well, for those of you who don't know, I'm a partner with my studio. I'm their chief people officer. So I was meeting with their team and helping them create better communication, better dialogue between the leadership team and the people who serve you guys every day. And I'm also getting ready to move to Phoenix. So um, that is taking up a lot of my free time. Yes. Next next Friday, right? Next, next Friday. Friday. St. Patrick's Day. I'm, I'm uh, leaving on a jet plane. I was offered a COO position in, in Phoenix at Relentless Media. So Chris and I will, uh, we will still be friends. Don't worry. We, uh... <laughs> we will. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I'm so excited for you and, and this opportunity. And man, you want to talk about, you know, taking some risks and having the right mindset to, to break through glass ceilings. I think that was, you know, definitely a great example of that. So congrats to you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what about you? What were you doing before this? <laughs> what was I doing before this? I had a meeting with another marketing uh, agency that we hired to consult us to level up our Google ads. So uh, we're really trying to go, a uh, little bit heavier into Google, still doing Facebook ads, but uh, they are like the Google ads agency. So really excited to be able to just level up the results for our clients as well. So nice. yeah, cool. All right, let me go ahead. Guys, if you can let us know, thanks so much for everybody for hopping on again. If you could put your camera on, that would be awesome. Let us know in the comments where you are from. So get in those comments. Uh, If you've ever been on a training with me, I like for you to be active and engaging. And that's what we want today. We don't want to just be talking at you guys. All right. See you, Florida. Lots of skills, people. Alicia, Jenna. Look at all these Floridas. The Pena, Brian Dixon, Steve Gagney, Eric. Yeah. Wendy. (laughs) Very cool. Thanks so much, guys. So just get used to to being in that chat. And let's just kind of do a quick overview about what today is going to look like. Give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Are we we good on that? Awesome. All right. So the art of breaking glass ceilings. We're really going to focus on three different areas. The first one is mindset and capacity. So what type of mindset does it take to break through glass ceilings? There aren't a ton of ladies out there, quote unquote, in our industry. But really, the ladies are kind of the ones that are running the programs And I know Kelly uh, is very, uh, you know, has some very strong viewpoints on this that we're going to be unpacking 
Um, and, you know, really just building our own capacity. Kelly and I were on a little bit before she was like, how are you feeling? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at my capacity right now. So we're going to talk about how to build that. And then we're going to switch gears and talk about the role of CEOs. So all three of us work with a ton of CEOs. And uh, even if you're not a CEO, if you're, you know, a team member, your career should be looked at like your own business and you are its CEO. So we're going to talk about the role of the CEO and then creating a culture of innovation and feedback so that your team is constantly pushing the envelope on innovation and leaning into having a culture of feedback. This is something that is very top of mind for us at GrowPro because I'm not the biggest fan of feedback. I got I to keep it real. I know what my strengths are. I know what my weaknesses are. And Kelly's been really helping me to create that culture of feedback because it all kind of trickles down from the top. So real quick, uh, if you've been living under a rock, we're going to do some <laughs> intros here, and then we're going to dive in. So, Kelly, you want to kick us off? Sure. I'm Kelly. I think I know a lot of you. Some of you I get the pleasure of working with every week. So, hello. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, Chris, for inviting me. Melody and Chris are some of my favorite people. Um, I've always admired and respected them, and I'm so grateful that they have had the skills to blaze the trail for us ladies in this industry um, I am a professional leadership and development coach. I have worked in the martial arts and fitness space for probably the last 15 years or so. I used to work for I Love Kickboxing as the director of franchise training. I helped to grow that franchise. Uh, I was the person who innovated a lot of the systems for that franchise, as well as did a lot of the training on really multi-levels. So CEO, manager, and really uh, the in the trenches training as well with the instructors and the coaches. And now I am a um, really just focused on what I call the second in command position. I run a program called the Manager Minecraft. I don't think there's enough attention on that role in our industry. There's a lot for CEOs. There's a lot of coaching and masterminds that focus on you as the CEO, but I've never felt like a CEO. I've always felt like my best skill set is supporting the CEO. And I'd like to shine attention on that role because I think it's A, very important. And uh, I also think it's possible to make a really great career if you have those skill sets as a second in command, as a studio manager. So I run a mastermind specific for that role where I train people. It's not a coaching program because I'm actually training and teaching and they're practicing, which is a really big piece of my philosophy on training is that they have to be doing and practicing and role playing in order to actually implement and um, I'm also, as I mentioned before, working with my studio, and I'm also the COO of Relentless. <laughs> I'm a mom. I have two small boys and a daughter in heaven and a wife, and um, I'm just really excited to be here. This is awesome. So thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you so much, Kelly. I have my uh, manager of my school in Kelly's Manager Minecraft. I think it's just such a, a cool program to you know have your second in command, like she says, um there so thank you so much melody really needs no introduction know, right? neither of you do <laughs> but you? we just got to make sure right because you know we got people from melody's crew here we got people from my crew we got people from kelly's crew so melody you want to give us a quick intro sure hi guys my name is melody johnson i am a master pediatric ninja specialist a, a self-proclaimed child whisperer I, right now, I own a company called Skills, and we license children's martial arts curriculums that are age-specific, that are game-based, play-based. I also train martial arts instructors on the child development and as it applies to science and psychology when it comes to helping children become the best versions of themselves. And my, I, you know, one day I want to leave the legacy of being the person who changed our industry when it comes to how we work with children and how to help them become the best version of themselves through uh, behavior by desire versus behavior by fear. And recently I have penetrated outside of the martial arts industry and I have been coaching my son's flag football team in the eight U division. We just won the championships for the second time in the row this past Saturday. We had an undefeated season and we are the smallest team out there. As a matter of fact, my son is the second smallest player out on the field, and he just got Defensive Player of the Year. 
And I believe it's not because of his natural given talent, but it's because of the coaching strategies that I apply that I've been teaching in the martial arts industry throughout the years. So what I want to do here in the next years, I want to get out of the martial arts industry, still be in the martial arts industry, but I want to get out and do podcasts, write books, get on big national stages and inspire parents to see that coaches and teachers who use positive child development strategies are the ones who are going to change the world. And then what that will do is bring exposure to the martial arts industry and bring more parents and more kids into the martial arts for the next generation to come. I love it. I will be the first person to buy that book. Can't wait. <laughs> yes. And Miss McClung says, I'll buy your book. I think everybody, if you would buy Melody's book, put book in the chat <laughs> box here, right? I mean, I'm sure every, I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm just, hey, Chris, I'm just waiting for somebody to write me a check. And some editor <laughs> come up and say, here's a check. And I'm like, let's go. <laughs> Got it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I'm Chris Rodriguez. I own Gracie Pack MMA of BJJ and MMA Academy here in Tampa, Florida. We just celebrated our 10 year anniversary last year. I got a, a rock star team in place that really allows me to be an offsite owner so I could focus on my other passion, which is marketing. I'm in our Grow Pro agency offices. Uh, right now, we do digital marketing for the martial arts school, and we just broke into the dance niche as well. We took on our very first dance client, and they have been crushing it. So we're excited about that. And um, I'm a mom. I got a little three-year-old. Um, everybody says there's a terrible twos. I don't know. I'm terrible thinking three. it might be the, the terrible three, right? Yep. That's what <laughs> happened. just turned three, and it just started. Oh, man. Um, so I'm really excited about today. Thank you so much, guys, for for hopping on. And let's get, you know, right to it. And, and let's talk about mindset and females in the industry. And if, you know, you're a, a guy on this call, this is incredibly important for you as well. Um, this is a male-dominated industry. However, it's interesting that the program directors, a lot of the general managers are predominantly female. And many times it's the wife of the male instructor that is running the off the mat stuff. So the three of us have all been instructors in, in a martial arts school, whether we worked for the school, own the school. Um, so Kelly, I'm, I'm going to kick it off with you because I know this is something you're super passionate about, but what are your thoughts on females in the industry and what some say is, is really a lack of representation? Yeah, I would say there's a lack of representation. I mean, if you look at um, speaking panels or events in our industry, Sometimes there's no females at all speaking. And if there, if it, if there are females speaking, it's usually one of us three, right? So, you know, I think there's so many bright, talented, motivated, inspirational women. I, I see some of them on this call. I'm staring at their right. faces and they have so much to offer and so much to give. And they are also, you know, people who have experience to bring to the table. And I think we're missing out on hearing from them. So I think it's a combination of two things. One, I think people who are running events need to pay attention to representation, need to invite more female speakers. But I also think it, it, the responsibility falls on us as well. We have to step up as women and say, my voice needs to be heard. I want to practice speaking on stages. I want to put my name in the ring, uh, take a chance on me. What do I need to do? And that's what I did. So I don't know if y'all have a story about how you started speaking. I mean, yeah, I, I had a platform with my former company, but after that, when I was out on my own and left that company, I just started asking people, hey, do you need another speaker? Would you like, would you be interested in hearing how I can help your event? Would you be interested in hearing what types of, uh, you know, knowledge I can contribute to this event? So I think it does fall on us as well. And then if you are someone who has women in your network that you know are smart and talented, nominate them, put them in touch mm. with event coordinators, get them connected, give them an opportunity to speak at your events. And let's help all of us sort of lift the female voice um, because I think, you know, it's, it's incredibly needed and we have the talent. So it's there. Absolutely. I'll, I'll never forget, uh, Melody told me this, this story and Melody, if you want to expand on it, but she was speaking at the super show and it was her and a bunch of other guys on stage. And afterwards, somebody came up to her and said something like, weren't you nervous being up there with all the guys? And she was like, no, they should be nervous that they're on stage with me. And I just absolutely loved that mindset. So Melody thoughts. 
Yeah, that was uh, Mike Chat and Dave Kovar and Roland Osborne, um, I believe. And yeah, you know, growing up being really small for my age, believe it or not, when I was younger, I was I was super tiny and I got I got bullied a lot. And I always just kind of had this little grit about me from New Orleans. And one of the things that I always said, especially in the martial arts industry growing up, I, I started martial arts in 87 in the dungeon dojo days, for those of you who, who don't know. So I've been in the martial arts for a while and it was definitely very male dominated. And a lot of the men were just, they were, they were, they had a lot of ego, but they couldn't back it up with their knowledge. So I always just kind of said, why not me? So anything that a guy can do, why, you know, why not me? Why can't I, I do this? And I was, I was, I was dumb enough to think that, uh, dumb enough and smart enough to jump into the preschool martial arts market in the nineties and create a preschool program. And I was getting certified in kickboxing on a cardio karate, you know, the NATMA cardio karate program. And the guy who was running it, his brother was in charge of this organization called NATMA for anybody who remembers NATMA back in the day. And I like, like you said, Kelly, you know, we need to speak up. And I went to him and said, Hey, I have this really cool program called the little ninjas. And can you show it to your brother? And he's like, sure. Why not? And he goes, come to high school and, and run a couple of classes. And I did. And his brother was like, wow, this is really, really cool. So I agree with Kelly where, you know, why not us? Why not mm -hmm. us being, you know, more, uh, more in on the stage, in the spotlight in front of everybody doing things. And I think that just sometimes women have that imposter syndrome and uh, mm -hmm. they have this, this fear of being judged. And I, I was, I wasn't worried with that. I guess it's kind of lucky. So I was always wired, like anything you can do, I can do better with my older <laughs> brother. Even a lot of times it was a stupid mistake, but I, you know, the times that it worked out for me, it led me to where I am today. <laughs> I love it. And, you know, for all of our ladies on here, um, you don't need permission to speak up for yourself. If you feel like you did need permission, the three of us are giving you that permission right now. <laughs> because just like Melody did, I went to Mike Metzger and I flat out said, you guys are lacking in digital marketing at Maya. I know what I'm doing and you should put me on stage. And that's exactly what happened. So, we all, especially now because of these devices and social media, all of us already have a platform. The question is, is are you using it and are you leveraging it? And, you know, I, I think this, this imposter syndrome thing is a very real thing, whether you're, you know, male or female. And I mean, when you're trying to do something you've never done before, how else are you supposed to feel? It's a part of the process. So once again, if you needed permission, we're giving it to you. We would love just to see some of the amazing women that are on this call start putting out more content, start, start uh, you know, speaking out more because we're a huge part of this industry. And, you know, I can't wait for the day where we don't call it a male dominated industry anymore. Awesome. There's also like we have skill sets and niches where it doesn't matter if you're male or female, like Melody, what you do has nothing to do with the fact that you're a girl, or it has nothing to do with the fact that I'm a girl, that I am training teams or that I'm helping managers level up their skills. So don't focus on that as the, the way to get in the door, focus on what you're good at, focus on what you know, focus on what you can bring to the table as a talent, as a contribution that nobody else is talking about and forget about the fact that you're female for a moment. And just remember, you're like, you're a badass. And that's what we need, right? Male and female. We need more people who have great ideas. I love it. If you resonate with that, put badass in the comments. And, you know, if you don't want to curse, you can just, you know, use like the little, there we go. Thank you, <laughs> Naomi. And, you know, what's really cool, we got Naomi DePena on here, which I had the honor of watching her speak when, yeah. Kelly, you put on your event. You want to talk yeah. a little bit about that real quick? Me or Naomi? <laughs> yeah, Kelly, you, Kelly. Oh. <laughs> well, I ran an event last year called Empower, and it was a personal development event, but it was really to highlight and showcase 
really strong women who had incredible stories of overcoming challenges, overcoming obstacles, or ways that we could help each other through things that were challenging. Um, and Naomi and her daughter actually shared the stage. It was a request that I had because she has a, a I can't remember how old she is now because she's growing like a weed. Um, beautiful young daughter who is just such a great example for younger girls. Again, we are an industry filled with young women who are about to become the next generation. And I, I encouraged her to invite um, Chloe to speak, speak with her on stage. And what an opportunity, right? I mean, how, Naomi, how is she, how old is she? Tell me. She's 13 now. And for her to have this experience is, is part of what I want to contribute. And part of what I hope to help young people do is even in my program, my management program, we do public speaking workshops because it is a skill. And even if you have great ideas, you still have to know how to present them and engage an audience. And now she has this on her resume. And I just can't wait to see what happens in the next 15 years with this young lady who's just going to light up the world, not to mention following in her mama's footsteps, who's already lighting up the world. Um, she's speaking on stages. She's a deputy mayor of her community and she's a business owner and she's doing all these amazing things outside of that, which I won't um, spill the beans on. But I just again, it's so important for us to and that's my contribution is how do I put on an event that highlights and showcases women um, and gives them the stage. So that was the point. Absolutely love it. Hopefully you guys get to see into kind of how our minds work and how we've been able to to get where we're at. Um, one of the one of the things over the last 10 years that that I've really seen just kind of at the forefront is the importance of working harder on myself than I do my job. It's a famous Jim Rohn quote. And, you know, myself and Melody and, and Kelly, we all have a lot going on. And I'm sure they get this question all the time, like, how do you do it all, right? I mean, I get that question on a, on a weekly basis. So I'd like to talk a little bit about building capacity and some of the things that each of us do that have helped us get to this level because there are levels to the game. So Melody, why don't, why don't you kick it off? Maybe what are some of the things that you do in your life that has helped you build a, a capacity, you know, to create and, and any tips that you might have? See me rubbing my hands. I get so excited yes. <laughs> when I talk about this particular topic. So for me personally, I'm all about momentum going into the day. So I don't, I, I, I wake up at 5.30, but I usually just chill and hang out in, in, in bed and just kind of run through just the process that I have to do every morning. But first things first in the morning, it's about spending undivided attention with my family. And then when my, when Jill's off to go work out and Van's off to school, I always prime the house. So I straighten up the house and I, I do that on purpose to get ready for my day. And then it's into self-study. So every single day I am working on one audio book and, I and I'm listening to multiple at one time. So depending on what I have to do that day is the audio book that I listen to. So for example, this morning I was listening to Mindset, Mindsight by Dr. Daniel Siegel because that was part of our CPNS course that we were doing today. Uh, yesterday, it was Good to Great by Jim Collins because we workshopped the flywheel effect. Uh, tomorrow, because I'm, I'm actually was supposed to be flying to St. Louis tomorrow to do a parenting seminar, competing to do an instructor certification, but it got snowed out. So I oh, wow. off until the following Sunday. So tomorrow, I'm going to listen to a personal development book. I'm going to go back into the Ikai, 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 Ikai. I can't, can't, I'm going to butcher it. But so tomorrow will be all in personal development. And I spend at least half hour listening to an audio book and taking notes on how to, or the, the key takeaways. And all that does is build momentum for me for the rest of the day. And it gets me set up. So for me, the key takeaway here is every single morning, I start with self-development and learning something new. And that's why whenever I see somebody driving a Bentley or see a, somebody riding in a private jet or see somebody in a big home, I say, why not me? And the reason why I'm able to say that is because I study hard to become a better version of myself. And I know as long as I'm studying and learning and growing, those opportunities are going to be endless. So if there's, if there's anything to, that you take away from this, do a lot of work, like you said, on yourself when it comes to learning and growing. And man, you watch, watch all the opportunities open up for you. Yeah. And I love how you have that like scheduled in. Right. And I think that's such a like a key component, uh, because if that doesn't sometimes get on the schedule, then it doesn't happen. 
And, you know, Kelly, I know you're big on time blocking. This is something that you're very passionate about, that you train other managers to do. This is something that uh, I absolutely loved when you trained Anna to do this every single week. I know exactly what she's working on at the exact minute. So talk to me a little bit about the things that you do in your life that that have helped you build this capacity to do everything that you're doing and be a present wife and a present mom and, and all of the really important stuff. Well, I mean, I have to say, Chris, you are like the, the primary inspiration behind what I would call self-discipline in your practice of, of these things that we're talking about, reading and working out and taking care of your body. And actually, Melody, you've been an inspiration for me about really the principle of family first. So I've learned a lot from both of you in, in both of those components. For me, a book changed my life about maybe 12 years ago when I went to the Genius Network. And that book is called The Miracle Morning by Hale Elrod. Uh, I tell everybody that I can to, to buy it, read it, implement it immediately. Um, and so those are sort of the things that I do as a practice. There are six, and he calls them savers. S-A-V-E-R-S, -E and they all stand for a different self-discipline or self-personal uh, development practice. And what he did was he interviewed some of the most successful, happy entrepreneurs. So I add that <laughs> word in, right? Fulfilled, not just the most, make, making the most money and working the most, but actually the most fulfilled. And he just, he tried to take the, the six things that were kind of common or universal with those people. And they were scribe, which is the first S, which is journaling, right? A lot of people are um, maybe not, familiar with how to journal. There's no rules. You just sit down, you, you mind dump if you want. You can use prompts if that's helpful for you, but it's a way to kind of clear your mind, purge yourself of whatever doubt or worry you, you have going on inside those, you know, between the two ears. The A stands for affirmations, which for me is really about how I talk to myself. We all talk to ourselves 24 hours a day, and that dialogue is very powerful. The V is for visualization, which I also highly believe in. Some of the most successful athletes practice this, seeing themselves win the game uh, before it even happens. The E is for exercise, which I think we all can, you know, attest to the benefits of that one. It's biological. The R is for reading. So I, I use this as a, a way to absorb. So reading, podcasts, TED Talks, all of that applies. And then the final S is silence. And um, you could say meditation. For me, this is about listening to my myself, my highest self, my inner wisdom, which I think is probably my gift, the intuition I have about just being able to sit and know what it is that I want, know what I have to do next, have that clarity to be able to make decisions. And so those have been the six things that I try to practice on a regular basis. Not, I'm not always perfect, um, but again, every time I see Chris Rodriguez posting on Saturday morning at 5 a.m., uh, it sure is a great inspiration to get back on my practices. <laughs> I love it. Great share. And it's amazing book. It's a quick read too, guys, which is, it's nice. It's, you know, not some, some thick book. I, I dropped the, uh, the name of it and, and the author in there. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is no worldly success can compensate for failure in the home. And I'm so glad that you brought that up, that it's not just about the success, you know, financially it's, you know, having success in all areas um, of, of your life. So great share, um, for me, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I distinctly remember watching this. It, it was, it was a clip of Oprah and she was interviewing, I can't remember who it was, but a celebrity. And she asked the celebrity, like, how do you do all of these things? And this celebrity, you know, has assistance and help and a makeup artist and a hair and all of these people. And she didn't say that at all. She didn't even bring up all of the people that helped her to do that. And I think oftentimes, uh, because the to-do lists are so long, because there's so many hats that, that we can wear, um, that we often do not delegate and outsource a lot of, of you know, what we might feel we're, we're held accountable or responsible for. And, you know, when, when people ask Chris, how do you get so much, like, I have an amazing personal assistant that is right there, that anything that are small little tasks or items that need to get done, but my time should be spent on other things. I have help. Right. And I, I think the, the, you know, the support system that we have in our lives can absolutely determine the capacity. Right. And, and I know, uh, you know, I know Jill helps a ton with skills. I know 
uh, you know, hear from Kelly all the time, how helpful Chris is as well. So I think it's important that you look at that support system. And if you are feeling, uh, you know, overwhelmed, like what are the areas that, that you can get help for so that you can, you know, focus on, on the higher level tasks. So, um, the other thing for me is making sure that I'm listening and being inspired and motivated, very similar to what Kelly said by like happy entrepreneurs. And this was a big one for me by entrepreneurs that are parents. Um, I absolutely love the Hormozies, Alex and Layla Hormozy. I consume all of their content. And I remember he was on a podcast and they were talking about, you know, morning rituals and what he does because you know, some people have some pretty prolonged morning rituals that take like hours and hours. And he was like, I wake up at 530, I drink a cup of coffee and I get to work. And I'm just thinking, man, that would be really awesome if yes. that was possible. Yes. But my little cruise missile is not going to allow that to happen. So just make sure, guys, when you are taking advice from people that they are, you know, uh, living what you're what you're trying to accomplish because we all could absolutely get more done if we didn't have children to take care of in the morning. So very cool. Anything else? Time we blocking. Time blocking is super helpful for that because we, the three of us, are putting that on the schedule. Like it's a non-negotiable that we are creating space for our families. I know both of you are really big on creating space for date night. Um, making time for co quality connection with your kids. And it's part of our work. So when we say that, it's like for some people, it's like, well, obviously you're a mom, but for people who are, for moms or dads who are entrepreneurs and running their own business, maybe that's not a non-negotiable for a lot of them. And it is for us. And it's it's declaring that the most important thing and making time for it. It's the same as the personal development. It has to be on the time block. It has to be like a non-negotiable it is your work to work on you. It's not an extra thing. It's not a luxury. It's not a, maybe I'll get to it if I can. It's a must do. And I think that's the difference. Melly, I, I remember uh, when the GSD terminology came out, right? Everybody was like, get stuff done. Melody said, ah, uh -uh. what did you say instead? Because this is right in line with it, right? Make stuff happen. <laughs> Don't get stuff done. Don't just get stuff done every day you make stuff happen. So very cool. And can I just add on to what you guys are talking about while well, we're addressing family? And I know we're going to move on to business stuff, but for those of you who are parents, I, I look at my, I look at my, my, I look at myself as a bank account. Um, and, and if I don't spend time with my family and my son, my bank account goes way down and I get very depleted. I get overextended. I get exhausted. And I, that's where my willpower goes away. Um, my creativity goes away. So the more time I spend with my family, the higher my bank account is. I look at that as my bank account, not my actual bank account. And if I can make a lot of deposits into that, that family time with Jill, family time with Van, and even all of my friends and my family, my in-laws, we spend a lot of time together. A lot of, a lot of other entrepreneurs may feel guilty for like taking a day off and going on the boat or, you know, just taking the day off and going to the park or going to the beach or even just binge watching on the couch. And to me, those are important to add to my bank account to help me have the resources that I need to go back and make stuff happen when it's time to make stuff happen. So don't feel guilty or, you know, I hope you don't feel guilty when you take time for yourself and take time for your family, because those are the things that contribute to your success, not inhibit or limit your success. I love it. If you guys are resonating with this, drop a one in the comments for me. Uh, such an important aspect of, of what we're doing, being able to build that capacity. I want to shift gears and get a little bit more focused on, on the business aspect. And if you are the CEO of the company, drop CEO, just so we know who, we're, who we have on the call. Give me a CEO. All right. We got a lot of CEOs on here. I love it. Very cool. So I put a post yesterday in my martial arts entrepreneurs group asking uh, business owners to drop what their top three priorities were for that day. And it was pretty interesting to see some of the comments. Some of them, in my opinion, were very in line with what CEOs should be doing. And others were maybe not so much in line. So I'd like to shift the conversation to talk about the role of the CEO, the skill sets, common mistakes 
that they that they make. So who wants to take it first? I'll, I'll take it first. All right, uh, Melody, let's do it. So uh, one of the things that I've made a mistake on, and I'm getting really good at it this year, just this year, like skills has been around for a decade. Uh, I've been consulting since 1999. So I've been in the industry for a really long time as far as the career path that I'm following. Uh, I've always been very poor at delegating to other people. Um, and, and I thought that I was delegating enough, but I wasn't delegating the right things. And one thing that I've learned, I just read, I, I consumed the book, Who Not How. If anybody has read Dr. Ben Hardy, all of his books, Be Your Future Self Now, Gap and Gain, Willpower is Not Enough. But the Who Not How, I hated that book I, when I first read it. I had a really strong love-hate relationship with it because I was like, not everybody can do what I do. Not everybody can do this. And I have to do this. If not, it's not going to get done right. And I felt very overextended in January because we just launched our instructor certification masterminds. I was going to only take 50 instructors. We ended up with over 100 instructors enrolled into the program. And I was getting bombarded every day with, hey, where's the course at? Hey, I'm having a hard time logging in. And, hey, when is the assignment due? And hey, what's going to be? In? And I was just like, what did I do? And on top of that, I'm competing on myself. I just got back into the competition. And on top of that, I'm coaching my son's flag football. And on top of that, of course, we're rebuilding our new tech platform. We've been building our skills 3.0. So again, going back to the mistakes that I've made, I didn't realize that the most important tasks I need to delegate. I was trying to oversee our tech platform for so long because I felt like only I knew what I wanted, but I'm not trained in UI and UX, which is user interface and user experience. So I hired Andrew to take over that part. And I stopped sitting in tech meetings every single week. And man, Andrew just reports, hey, here's where we're going with the menu. Here's where we're going with the design. Here's how now the drills are being displayed. And it, it was like, oh my gosh, what else can I now delegate? And to the point now where and when I have my team meetings every single week, I'm delegating as much as I can. That way, all I have to do is create. Is I, 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 I learn and I create and I share. And then my team is running everything else. So if you're one of those CEOs who thinks nobody else can do what I do as well as I do, think again and read the book, Who Not How. It's, it's, it's shifted my mindset just in the last 90 days. It's made a big difference in our company. I love it. Kelly, you work with a ton of managers, so I'm sure you get feedback from them about the CEOs. You know, thoughts on the role that the, the CEO should be playing and uh, you know, we yeah. get to maybe skill sets in a little bit too. I think one thing to think too is like y'all have, most of you have martial arts or fitness studios and you are what you would consider a CEO, but many of you are also what I would consider an operator. And that is a synonymous term for studio manager, which is who I train. So to Melody's point, you need to stop being two full-time roles. You need to get yourself out of the studio operator position. You need to hire a second in command and you need to enroll them in my program so I can train them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that is a starting point for many of you being that you are trying to do two full-time jobs and maybe you don't recognize that because those of you who are true CEOs and can be the visionary as Melody just suggested is one of your main roles, is going to find that very hard to do if you are also doing the day-to-day -day operating, um, you know, overseeing the team, hiring the team, training the team, doing the marketing, doing all of those different things. Again, it's a, it's a two full-time position. So I want to start there. The second thing I think is really important for a CEO, uh, I, we would call it like chief energy officer. You guys set the tone. You set the vibe. Your energy affects us. Your vision affects us. I say us because I always just sort of like assume the role of like the, the second in the command. I, I don't ever feel like a CEO. I don't think it's in my skill set. I don't like being a CEO. Um, so when I say me or us, that's what I'm referring to. And I think the CEO has this opportunity to help the vibe or the energy. And that can be such a game changer for creating a positive work environment. A lot of times CEOs will bring stress with them to work really, really taxing and difficult for the team. And um, it's inappropriate, it's unprofessional. So stop stressing them out. You get a coach, you get a mentor that you can go vent to, that you can complain to, that you can talk about challenges with. It's not your team's responsibility to dig you out of a hole, right? Um, so I think that's a big thing. 
The second thing I would say for, for a CEO is to hire the right people to get the right people in place. You are always going to have to have a team if you want to be around for a long period of time, if you want to scale, if you want to replicate, if you eventually want to have more free time, more family time, you've got to have the team. So making sure that you're putting the right people in the right seats is always going to be your primary job so that you can, again, do what Melody is suggesting, which is to delegate and to take things off of your own plate. So I would say that, and then making sure there's enough people coming through the door. Those are like my top three for you guys as studio owners, making sure you're creating a great work environment, culture, um, energy, and then hiring the right people, making sure that you've got the right people in the right seats. And then finally making sure there's enough people coming in the door so your team can do their job, sign people up, get them to pay, stay and refer and reach their goals. If there's not enough people coming in the door, they can't do that. So you have to be the mastermind there. And I know a great marketing company that can help you. Whoa, thank you for that softball pitch. I'll take it from here. Awesome. <laughs> Kelly, I love the chief energy officer. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a little vulnerable here. Um, my two stepsons, Nate and Darian, um, have both worked in the, the martial arts school. Uh, Nate started when he was 11. Darian was about 14. It literally came out of my mouth. As long as you're under my roof, you're working in the school. Uh and neither of them want anything to do with taking over the school. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that I ever made because I wasn't controlling my energy very well. I was very much a dictator in my martial arts schools. When we were in meetings, my voice was the only voice that you heard. And when I think back and I'm thinking like, man, you know, when, when we were uh, offering after school and summer camp and evening programs. At the height of it, I probably had 12 employees and we're in meetings and I'm thinking my one brain is bigger, better than the other 12 in the room, not asking for their feedback, which we're going to talk about here in a second. And this is, uh, you know, it was a really hard lesson that I learned and I'm blessed to have another opportunity when I started Grow Pro to take all of those lessons learned in running a team at the academy and, and basically do the exact opposite here. And, you know, now we've, uh, I've got 32 employees between both of, of the companies. And my job at both is to take care of my team so they can take care of the people. And um, one of, I think the, like, the specific moments that I can remember that this, like, it was like, oh, this is working, is we were in a meeting. Um, we we do EOS meetings, entrepreneurial operating system meetings called the level 10. And there was a to-do. A to-do is basically, hey, we have this issue. This is the task that needs to get done. You've got seven days to get it done. We're going to hold you accountable by asking you in the next meeting whether or not it got done. And I said, I'll go ahead and take that. And I'll never forget my marketing director. Her name is Christina as well. She goes, are you sure you want to take that on? Because I think you're going to be the bottleneck here. And it was, man, like kudos to her because she was right. She knew that I was probably going to slow the rest of the project down because there are other things on my to-do list besides this item that anybody else on the team could have helped with. So just to kind of share real quick, you know, like uh, this is exactly what my role is in the company. So we follow the entrepreneurial operating system. We have an accountability chart that everybody has their top five roles. And these are mine. I am the face of the company, the relationships. I shake hands and kiss babies, making sure not to do that the other way around. We don't want to kiss hands and shake babies. That wouldn't be good. I'm responsible for <laughs> R&D research and development. I'm responsible for ideas and growth. Just like Kelly said, I got to make sure that the ideas and the growth are there. So we have enough people coming through the door. Now that doesn't mean I'm the one that has to execute it. Uh -huh. And that's a big difference guys. Right. And I'm the culture guide. Everything lives and dies by the culture in our business. And I'm responsible for protecting that at all costs. What, um, any maybe like very specific mistakes you guys see that CEOs, like if you had to say like, man, this is like the number one mistake I see CEOs make, what, what would you say that is? No, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. I'll, I'll say it is, is thinking that you have to be better and smarter than your team. So a perfect Ooh. example is when I, when I was teaching martial arts classes, 
I always felt like it was my school and I had two men working for me. So I had to be the best instructor and I had to teach the best and teach differently so that they knew that I was, I owned the school. And then the problem is when I started stepping off the mat and traveling and doing instructor certifications, I'd come back and I'd ask the parents, hey, how are classes? And they're like, eh, they're good. It's just not the same when you're not around. Like, so, so how stupid was I to, to try to set them up for not having that success by feeling like I had to be better. And that's when I created skills and I made sure that the curriculum that we did and the systems that we do, everything's systematic. So whether I was teaching or Andrew was teaching or Epperson was teaching, it was the same. And once I created those systems in place and I trained them to be just as good as me, if not better, and I started traveling, I come back and I was like, how were classes? And they're like, man, Andrew teaches just like you and Epperson teaches just like Andrew. And, you know, that's, and it's interesting because that's the generation of on the mat martial arts. I sold my school on the mat martial arts in 2016 to Andrew and Andrew just sold the school to Epperson and Clayton last August. Epperson just consumed the school on her own from Clayton. So you could see the cycle generations of the school having success now, mostly because I got out of my own way as an egotistical CEO and said, well, my team needs to know that I'm the CEO and I'm better than everybody else. So that's just one mistake that I made that I'm, I'm learning not to do anymore. As a matter of fact, I just hired my director of business development and he's taking over a lot of the sales and marketing strategies from skills so that I can step away, not only be creative for content for skills, but also be creative for content outside of the industry. And everybody go, man, your director of business development right now is rocking it out with your company, even when you're not away. Love it. Kelly, biggest mistake? I guess similar. I would say that it's, it's, uh, the mistake is not looking in the mirror, right? Like your team, your business is a reflection of you. And I know that that's sometimes hard and it hurts. So I, I hate to be like the one to stick the dagger in the heart. But if you have people on the team that you don't like, if they're not performing, you have, you know, numbers you're not happy with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's your fault. The good news is you can fix it, right? So it's taking ownership. It's It's a favorite mantra of mine. It's my fault, but I can fix it. I think a lot of people are always blaming these outside in you know circumstances. Of course, I hear as a team trainer, well, my my team is lazy. They don't take initiative. They don't do this. They don't do that. And of course, my response is always, well, did we set them up to win? Did we provide them with the tools that they need to be successful? And if not, it's your fault, right? So I think that's the big thing is look in the mirror, figure out ways that you can level up as a leader, as if you are a manager, if you are in fact working with your team, again, different types of companies, right? So you as a studio owner, if you are actively engaged in the day-to-day -day operations, you have to know how to manage people. Do you have skill sets to manage people? If not, you need to work on it. You need to understand relationships and communication, study emotional intelligence. It's not just about your business acumen. It's about the way you can interact and connect with your team. So yeah, look in the mirror. I love it. Uh, you know, if I, if I had to say one thing, um, I'm, I'm going to piggyback off of both these ladies. And I, I just think it's a, a lack of focusing on developing leadership skills. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it is. We focus so much on, oh, do I have the perfect schedule? Do I have the perfect pricing structure? You know, and uh, I, my, you know, my question, we hear it a lot, like we can't find good people, right? I mean, Kelly, I know you've heard that. Melody, I know you've heard that. We can't find good people. And my question is to, you know, to to an owner that says that is, you know, are are you a person to attract good people, right? Are you are you the leader that they need? And I, I just think that um, in, in most companies, when you start having, you know, team members, your shift has to be on, you know, we create so much content for our prospects, right? We'll, we'll put out posts for our prospects and create videos for our prospect. What are you doing for your team? What kind of content are you generating for your team to make them better, right? So let's, let's talk about one of my least favorite topics here. Uh, <laughs> But you're getting See, so good at it. I Come know. On. I'm I'm working on it, guys. I really am. I'm I'm working on it. And and it's feedback. So we got about 11 minutes here. We're going to skip the innovation and and go to feedback because this is just so important for for anybody whether you're the CEO or, you know, whether you're a team member on here. Um I heard this podcast by Layla Hormozy and and she was talking about accountability. And I think, you know, a lot of CEOs struggle with holding their team accountable, right? And she basically said, you got to put an expectation 
you got to have a measurement, a specific like KPI number that will let you know whether or not it's occurring. And then you have to give feedback. And I think that typically we, we do a decent job of setting the expectation. Pretty rare do we set a measurement. If you ask somebody to do something, what is the exact result that you are looking for? I think we focus so much on the step-by-step. -step. Tell them the result that you want. I want solution-oriented, result-oriented people, not just you know people that can check off tasks. Um, but it's often the feedback aspect that gets laid out. And for many, including myself in the past, I would just rather avoid it. Um, we give feedback to our students. We're all really good at giving feedback to our students, but oftentimes we lack this with our, our team members. So would love to know both of your thoughts on developing a culture of feedback in our schools. I'll take this one because we're starting to do it now because you're right, Chris, this is a, a big trend in the martial arts industry. We're so caught up in, in our own egos sometimes that we're afraid to get that feedback and we're, we don't, we're afraid to, you know, make mistakes because we, we've been raised in this hierarchy of belt levels and, and mastership and senior master and chief master and so forth. One of the things that we're doing very well, and we just, we even did it yesterday and today, is we're doing uh, monthly masterminds. So during the masterminds, we're assessing our team on a scale of one to five and different, like you said, KPIs. So for what I specialize in, for example, yesterday we had each each of our um, mastermind clients assess each one of their team members in their passion for the purpose, their knowledge and passion for the values and their level of knowledge and training and all the systems that they're responsible for. They scored them on a scale of one to five, five being great. And if you have somebody in your team that you're that you're assessing and that at a three on the passion on purpose, asking them, what can I do better to help you understand the passion for our purpose or to improve your passion for purpose? And those monthly masterminds are, are gonna be fire for our team. And even today, one of the things we did in our CPNS classes, we assessed them on their mindset. You know, where how do they, on a scale of one to five, how do they feel about threats, coercion, and punishment towards children when they misbehave? How do you feel about the growth mindset towards children? So assessments on a monthly basis are critical for growing and building that momentum and keeping that flywheel turning. If you haven't read the book Good to Great by uh, Jim Collins, you know he addresses like what Kelly said. You got to get the right people on the bus. You got to get them in the right seats. And then you have to have this culture of discipline to train them to keep that flywheel going, not just put them in the right seats and say, okay, off you go, right? And that's one thing, Kelly, that's why, you know, you have, a, you're building a career on that because a lot of people are not very good at that. That's why I bring Kelly in. She's like, also <laughs> like our company therapist, right? It's like, <laughs> just, I need you to, you know, oversee this conversation here. So Kelly, this is a topic, you know, you're, you're very passionate about. We've literally had you come into our company and spend an entire day on helping us develop a culture. Yes, multiple times twice. because- yeah. They got to hear it again, right? Yeah. So talk well, to me about culture feedback. First thing I think is is safety, creating a, a psychologically safe space for people to express themselves and not feel like they're going to get in trouble, not feel like there's going to be um, a, a reprimand or, you know, even again, just come back to like your energy. How do you respond when people give you feedback? Are you defensive? Which most of us are. Uh, even, you know, in our personal relationships, it's very difficult to get feedback from people that we care about. And that makes sense. We're humans. We take things personally because most of us are perfectionists and we want things to work. And that kind of gets sometimes twisted and confused. And what the receiver is hearing is not what we're intending. So there's some communication issues going on. But the starting point for me is, is safety, making sure that people feel safe enough to express themselves uh, the second thing is similar to what Melody said is systems. There have to be systems of feedback. It cannot be a sporadic and occasional uh, random thing. There have to be really consistent systems of feedback in place. And I like to create formulas. So if you've worked with me, you've maybe heard I have a difficult conversations formula so that we have a, a language together that we can all use and share in when we're delivering feedback to one another. So we don't have to think about it too much. We just follow the formula and it does make things a little bit easier for us to share because if it is a difficult topic or if it's difficult conversation, we get caught up in the emotion of it versus the content of it. So that formula, formalizing it can help take away the emotion and make it more systemized so that it can be more productive. And then you pair that um, with empathy. 
empathy is a really underrated skill set. And a lot of us fail to work on this as the leader of our team. You have to be willing to put yourself in the other person's shoes. I think it's probably one of my gifts is that I've become a really great listener because the first reaction I have when people are telling me their story is how can I see it from their point of view? How can I understand what they're potentially feeling uh, so that I can either A, make changes if, if I need to, or B, just explain things better. I don't need to agree to empathize. And that's an important distinction. They're not the same thing. I can understand how you might be feeling that way. I don't have to agree. I can say, let me help you understand it from my point of view, right? So um, those would be my maybe starting points for creating a culture of feedback. I, every single Minecraft, I at the end of that Minecraft, I will post a survey, how did I do? I am trying to model for the teams that I'm open to feedback, criticism, constructive, you know, um, anything that will help me grow and be better because my job as a leader is to serve you, right? It's not the other way around. So I want them to feel comfortable and open to share with me what could have been better, what didn't work. And I find it so valuable so that I can just keep upping my game. You know, we got Melody, the child whisperer on here, and then you've got Kelly, the people whisperer <laughs> on here. And you know, one of the things that I'd like to touch on and, and something Kelly has helped me develop is, you know, how do you create that safety environment, right? Where somebody feels safe and like you care about your people, you build the relationship with them. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and it, it really has to do with, with parenting is rules without relationship leads to rebellion. I mean, you can kind of think of that in our in our own company, right? We have to build that relationship. You care about them. So you need to look as the CEO. And if it's not going to be you, then it's a team lead. But I do a monthly one-on-one 15-minute check-in with every single employee on my team. Uh, it takes two days to be able to get through it. Um, I have kind of gone through different iterations because... That's 30 some odd conversations you're having. And, and you know, the, the the first one compared to the last one, I need to give them that, that level of energy. But that's just one small way that you can start creating that, uh, you know, culture of, of feedback. And there might be a, a time when we have 50 employees that I'm unable to do it. So I'm going to do it with my leadership team. And then my leadership team will do it with their department. But man, guys, you know, we spend so much time on all of these other things. How come we can't take 15 minutes a month or a week if you have a smaller team or every other week to build that relationship, to create this safe environment where feedback is, you know, wanted. We, uh, I do a sync meeting every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with my personal assistant. It's the first thing we do. It takes about 15 minutes. We have specific uh, questions that we ask each other. And one of her questions she asked me is, do you have any feedback on my performance from the last week? She asked that, right? So one of the things that was really helpful was just having a conversation with our team of what is feedback and why sometimes we don't like it because some of the words that people are associated with feedback is, is really, you know, negative. And this was a huge turning point for us and, and our company um, when we really started to put having this culture of feedback. And I mean, Kelly, the one thing you said, like, are this is a question we ask before we give feedback. Are you in a place to receive feedback right now? I never once thought to ask this person that I'm giving feedback if they're in a place for it. Maybe they just got a text from a family member and there's a situation going on. Maybe they just got off a call with a client and the client's asking them to do 20 different things that they need to get done by the end of the day. That one little question, are you in a place to receive feedback has been so incredibly powerful for us and, and our company. And we got that thanks to having Kelly come in. So much appreciated. Yes. And, you know, I think many of you can probably relate to Chris feeling like it's it's intimidating or, you know, what is all this mushy, gushy emotion, you know, having to listen to people's feelings stuff all about. Um <laughs> You know, it may not be in your, you know, natural operating order, but I do think it's critical in keeping your employees happy long-term. Absolutely. Can I, can, I add, 
Can I add something onto that too? You know, another thing that is important because it's, you don't want to get a feedback from a dummy <laughs> and I'm just going to be blunt where they don't know what they're doing. So how are you going to give me feedback on something that you're not trained on? So that goes back to the importance of making sure that you're not just having team meetings, but you're having team trainings and your team is continually being educated so that they're educated enough so that when they provide you feedback, you have a lot of respect for them because they're knowledgeable in that area and because they, they're becoming an expertise. And that kind of circles back to the mistake that I made as a CEO is I wasn't training my team very well. So when they gave me feedback, I was like, who are you, you know, to, to, give, to give me feedback. And now what we do is we do so much intensive training that their level of knowledge is so high. I respect them so much more that when they're giving me feedback, I'm like, yeah, you know what you're doing. So it, that guy goes back when it's on you as well. If you're going to get feedback, make sure that you're giving them the educational resources to be knowledgeable and we're building the experience to share, hey, this education is working or hey, this education isn't working and I need more training on this area, right? If that, if that makes sense to everybody. I love it. Guys, if you could just let us know, uh, because I'd love to do this again. If you'd like for us to, you know, maybe have another conversation like this, drop a one in the chat. If you found value in the last hour, I'd love to know what your your biggest, just one, just one takeaway, right? Whether it was, you know, a specific tip, whether it was a mindset shift, what is the one takeaway that you have? And, and if you have multiple, that's great, but just one, go ahead and, and put that in the comments there. And as they do that, uh, Kelly, Melody, how can everybody, what, what do you guys got going on? How can people connect? I'm going to drop the Facebook group, but you know, I also want to say if, if you have yourself. any suggestions for our future podcast, put them in the <laughs> chat to the right, because I think you, title will probably be the hardest part. <laughs> yeah. Did you just ask for feedback? Is that what, is that what that was? <laughs> Are you guys in a good place for feedback right now? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you, I, I have a manager mind tra Minecraft training program. And if you're interested in knowing more about it, I'd love to tell you it's, it's super in, in, in um, it's collaborative. It's a, a program where I try to model exactly how I train the team so that you can take that information back with you so that it's actionable. Um, there's a whole library of content that I've done every week. It's curated specifically for the group based on their feedback and challenges that they're having. So it's actually really relevant and applicable. And really that's all I'm doing as far as like in the, in this industry for the public, obviously I'll be starting my new role next week. So I'll be um, busy doing COO things. <laughs> um, I'd love to connect with you guys though. So friend me on Facebook and I do have a free group that is specific for managers of martial arts and fitness studios. So you can find me there as well. Awesome. Melody, what are you up to and how can people connect? Yeah. Yeah. You like uh like kelly i have a free group it's the it's, the link is right there uh, i share a lot of content blogs articles on stages of development of children i share a lot of free drills i'm more about giving to you guys so much so that if you like what i have to say then you'll look into like what we do a little bit deeper so if you're not on facebook then go to skillsworldwide.com and then click on resources and there's free content there that'll put you on our email list so that you're continually receiving uh, free content in your inbox every single day whether it's a blog we have free life skills curriculum and uh and that's if you're working with children and you want to help your team members uh, become better instructors working with with kids and i'm the one uh, you go to for that child whisperer. I love it. Uh, <laughs> some of these major takeaways, are you in the right place for feedback? Focus on myself more than my business, guys. That is a huge one. Man, there's there's just something that unlocked in me when I made sure to fill up my cup first. Uh, re, let's see what else we got. Uh, get them both to the seven-figure conference, set time block for family. That is so huge. We time block for our business, time block for the most important aspect of your life. CEO doesn't have to execute their own vision. No, you don't. And you shouldn't be. All right. You sh absolutely should not be the one executing the vision. Set time for me. Am I saying or truly offering opportunity? Yes. Right. Why should somebody want to come and work for you? Me time. I need to work more on myself. I love that these are the takeaways that you guys are, are providing formulation for feedback. It's okay to take a break. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, if you want to connect with me, there's my Facebook group. I was inspired by Melody 
um, to put out a piece of content every single weekday. And I have been going strong for almost two years yeah. now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it's not easy, guys. Yeah. Like, it's not easy. <laughs> but uh, highly inspired by Melody from that. And I uh, just want to respect everybody's time and stuff like that. Thank you so much for hopping on with us. Please connect with us in the Facebook group. Melody, Kelly, this was so much fun. And why did it take us so long to do it? And we will absolutely do this again. <laughs> Love you guys. All right. Love, love you. Guys. you. All right. Thank you. All right, guys. Bye -bye. Have a good one. Bye-bye.